Okay, right. Um, so th thanks, Carla and, and the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my uh, talk is going to be on cell type heterogeneity, and I'm going to uh, frame this uh, discussion in the context of uh, cancer epigenomics. Um, and being an educational session, I will probably spare a fair amount of time at the beginning on, on an introduction and highlight the role of DNA methylation in carcinogenesis. Francois has obviously already done a lot of the introduction, so I probably have can spend less time on it. Uh, and then the bulk of the talk will be on uh, describing uh, the cell type heterogeneity, uh, both the opportunities and the challenges it poses to the interpretation of cancer epigenomic data. And being a computational scientist, I will also sort of, uh, describe the solutions that, that we have developed, or the groups have developed, to tackle this uh, very important problem. Uh, and then, towards the end of the talk, I will uh, describe some of the novel insights that we have gained in both EWAS and cancer epigenome studies through application of this methodology. Okay, so I'll begin with, uh, uh, with this landscape that Conrad Waddington proposed uh, over 60 years ago now, uh, which I'm sure that most of you are, uh, have seen before. Um, it's uh, a very simplistic uh, landscape, uh, but it's also very powerful in that it shows, it's a, in fact, a model for how cellular development and differentiation proceeds. Um, uh, so, so in, in effect, it's, it's, uh, what you have is, 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 a, is, a, is a series of canalization events or bifurcations which effectively control where cells, uh, which path cells will differentiate. And of course, this process, this whole process is an epigenetic one. Okay, so what differentiates liver cells, say, from skin cells, is this is determined by an epigenetic program. And uh, Francois has already mentioned uh, what, uh, uh, what the two main modifications are. So on the one hand, you've got DNA methylation, which is a, an epigenetic modification of the cytosins on the DNA, which is usually on a, um, a CPG context, uh, although it also happens obviously in a non-CPG context. Uh, and then you've also got histone modification. So both of these epigenetic modifications control how compact the DNA is uh, and controls accessibility of transcription factors, which in turn may switch on genes. Okay, so I'm going to talk entirely on DNA, meth uh, on DNA methylation. Uh, and a number of reasons why I'm going to focus on DNA methylation. First reason is that it's a DNA-based assay, um, and therefore it's much more reliable than uh, ChIP-seq for instance, and also, uh, indeed, RNA-seq. Uh, and it is at present really the only mark that we can measure reliably in a cost-effective uh, way in large numbers of clinical uh, specimens. In fact, there's a very nice uh, paper published by a group here in Gothenburg, uh, uh, where they actually show that the DNA methylation beat areas, the new versions of these DNA methylation beat areas, which uh, Francois also mentioned, that they can uh, be run very successfully on paraffin-embedded tissue. Um, it is obviously that the choice of mark, the epigenetic mark of choice for also the large international cancer international consortia. So I'd like to say a little bit about how we quantify it. Um, I'm not going to delve into the technology, but um, what is actually important to realize here is that the methylation at the given locus is quantified typically in terms of a ratio of, if, it's, if you've got bisulfide sequencing, this would be sort of the number of methylated reads that cover a particular site. This would be the total number of reads. Or in the case of bead arrays, this is the intensity uh, that you measure in the methylation channel to the total intensity, okay? So it's, it's uh, effectively you interpret this as the fraction of cells that are methylated at a given CPG site. Now, one of the um, important things to note about DNA methylation um, is that you can measure this extremely accurately, okay? So um, it's possible to measure one to 5% changes with over 90% sensitivity, and there's a very nice example of uh, the locus that maps to the repressor of the arohylocamp receptor, 
which has been shown very reproducibly across the 10 or so more blood EWA studies that have been performed, that this particular locus undergoes hypermethylation uh, uh, in, in smokers. Uh, and um, it's not just this locus, but in fact, this particular study performed a meta-analysis and identified a whole set of 62 sites that generally most of them lose methylation in the blood of smokers. So a 2% change, what it means is effectively is that of every 100 cells that you measure, only two are, are showing a change. So it's quite remarkable that you can detect this. So remember this because I'll, I'll come back later to, to, this, um, to this observation that we see a lot of hypomethylation in the blood of smokers. Now, methylation is, uh, is functional, and the relation between methylation and gene expression, if you focus on the promoter, is highly nonlinear. Uh, so there's a nice sort of L shape. So if you've got the promoter is methylated, then generally speaking, the gene is silenced. And if the promoter is unmethylated, then it's not predictive. So you don't know whether the gene is silenced or not. And what you need to do then is to use histone. Uh, marks, system modification marks to actually tell if it's in an active or repressive state. Okay, so um, methylation is highly cell type specific, being functional, that is what you would expect. The key thing to note here is that it's actually very easy to find sites in the genome, and I'm showing about 716 of them, where the changes in methylation between cell types, these are immune cells here, so different types of immune cells, and for instance, fibroblasts and epithelial cell lines, you can actually find almost 100% differences in methylation. Uh, and this is uh, very important because it's one of the reasons why interpreting methylation data in complex tissues is almost impossible if you don't actually adjust for cell type heterogeneity. But it's also the reason why um, you can adjust for it quite, quite robustly. Okay, so also observe that methylation is very stable within, for instance, the same cell type. So it's a beautifully uh, flat profiles. Okay, so, um, so why are we interested in methylation uh, in, within the, uh, you know, from a biological clinical perspective? And Francois has already mentioned this. We know it's altered in cancer. This has been observed by many groups a long time ago. Um, this is an example of our own work where we, did, uh, we generated methylation landscape of ER-positive breast cancer, and there are two main subtypes. And also, we have normal breast tissue to provide us with the right reference. Uh, and what you can see is that, and these are actually mostly promoter regions, you can see that most of them actually gain methylation in cancer uh, and correspondingly show underexpression. And there's another important observation from this is that when you're comparing the two main subtypes of ER positive breast cancer, it's not actually which sites are differentially methylated that really distinguishes them, but also the fact that the degree of methylation change, the degree of expression change, is much more aggravated, much more accentuated in the luminal B breast cancers. And we think that a lot of this has to do with cell proliferation. So these luminal B breast cancers proliferate much more than the ER-positive luminal A ones. And this is what is telling us is that a lot of the changes you see in cancer are actually just a consequence of cellular proliferation. Uh, and in fact, we've, sort of, um, um, we've done f uh, further work on, on this, uh, but I would probably not talk about it uh, due to in the interest of time. Okay, so it's changed in cancer, but the reason why we are particularly excited about it is that you see methylation changes happening in normal cells. Okay, as a function of uh, cancer risk factors. So, of course, uh, age is the major demographic risk factor for cancer, and it's been long been known that DNA methylation changes as a function of age. Um, it also changes as a function of viral infections, bacterial infections, smoking, and inf inflammation. The exciting thing, though, is that when you actually look at where these changes happen in the genome, um, there are specific sites, those that increase, that gain methylation as a function of exposure, that tend to overlap between all these risk factors. Uh, and in particular, they seem to target 
uh, developmental and tissue-specific transcription factors, many of which are marked by this polychrome repressive complex. So let me actually show you what is the, this PRC2 complex. So it's, uh, I'm showing it here. So there are so three main components of it. Um, and, uh, and so this observation that I alluded to in the previous slide leads to this particular stem cell model of oncogenesis, which has been put forward by Feinberg and Stephen Bale and many others many years before, but which really gains strength in view of the fact that we see a lot of these sites, these PRC2 sites, to, that, that acquire methylation as a function of aging cancer risk factors. So what we think is happening is that um, this methylation that happens at these particular sites creates an epigenetic diversity which with further accumulation, with further accumulation of, of methylation changes as a result of further exposure to risk factors and aging, may silence, irreversibly silence, some of these uh, transcription factors. So once you've acquired methylation, generally it's, much, uh, it's unlikely that you will lose it. So it actually leads to an irreversible uh, silencing of these transcription factors. So this uh, can lead to impairment of differentiation, which we know is an early cancer hallmark. And what it will do at the cellular level is to cause uh, or to generate a, a mosaic structure, which we believe is so, uh, characteristic of a pre-cancer state. With further alterations, genetic mutations, for instance, then cancer clones are thought to emerge. Okay. Um, so, if we look at cancer itself, um, we, this would sort of generate a hypothesis that if, uh, if you look at cancer, that tissue-specific transcription factors should be preferentially silenced in that cancer type. And this is exactly what you can show. So, uh, what, I'm showing, what, what I'm displaying here is for four different cancer types. So these are two, uh, this is lung squamous cell carcinoma and lung adenoma carcinoma, kidney cancer, bladder cancer. If you look at the uh, if you look at the transcription factors that are generally highly expressed in lung, that most of these tend to be silenced. And they're preferentially silenced compared to genes that are also highly expressed in the tissue and which are non-housekeeping genes. So this is actually non-trivial because it clearly suggests that this event is being selected for. And if you actually look at what sort of alteration is associated with this silencing, it's not uh, losses or mutations that seem to correlate most strongly, but actually DNA methylation. So you can see that across many of these cancers, you've got a lot of methylation events. So it's much more frequent event. Okay. Okay, so let me move on now to the... So this finishes the uh, introductory part. So let me actually now talk about cell type heterogeneity. And... Um, it is extremely important to... Uh, map and understand cell type heterogeneity for a number of, uh, 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 to, to tackle a number of problems. So, for instance, if you want to quantify cancer risk, as I mentioned in the previous slide, being able to quantify that epigenetic diversity in your tissue is likely to be key for predicting the risk of a cancer clone emerging. But also, for instance, to understand response to therapy. So, immunotherapies, for instance, may fail or not due to the specific um, uh, 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 clonal uh, distribution of clones within your tumor. And also the risk and site of distant metastasis is well known to be uh, determined by cell type heterogeneity. So for instance, some breast cancers metastasize to the bone, it is thought because the breast tissue recruits mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow, which then prime these cells to metastasize to the bone. Okay, so it's a key really to address all of these challenges, and it's important when uh, when when mapping cell type heterogeneity and, and, and interpreting it to also uh, uh, understand that there are two types of heterogeneity, right? So there's this intratumor clonal heterogeneity, which I've uh, already mentioned, uh, and also this tissue heterogeneity where you've got infiltration of immune cells, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and adipocytes, and it's the interactions between these cell types that is very likely to be very important in understanding, for instance, distant metastasis. Now, the talk will focus more uh, on, on the actual challenge that cell type heterogeneity uh, 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 imposes on, on, for instance, analyzing these data sets. So, um, if we actually 
go to one of these public repositories, Geo and Air Express. These are two well-known public data repositories. There are over 5 million omic profiles on them. And actually, a very high proportion of these have been generated in bulk tissues. If you actually think about it, what, you, what you've got there is literally just average profiles. You're just averaging of all the cell types in your tissue. So it's an underutilized resource, a massively underutilized resource. So we have to have ways to now reanalyze this data in a way that we can deal with the cell type heterogeneity. And of course, it's also very important in the context of developing non-invasive uh, uh, pre-diagnostic and pre-diagnostic tools based on plasma DNA. So you can measure methylation in plasma, uh, but of course, most of the cell-free DNA will come from lymphocytes. And what you actually want to do is you want to identify the changes or the DNA modifications on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, in the tumor DNA. And so this is, again, a cell type heterogeneity problem where we have to deconvolute and identify the changes that are actually due to the tumor. So what I would like to do next is to give you a few examples of how um, uh, uh, cell type heterogeneity can affect your statistical inference. And the, the first example is actually not cancer, but it doesn't really matter whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or uh, a cancer like breast or ovarian cancer, um, you will see exactly the same thing. So what, what, what you observe if you compare cases and controls, if you measure methylation in whole blood and you look for differentially methylated sites, so this here on the y-axis is the significance, this is the change in methylation. So you can see that there's a, a lot of changes that you, that, that you would pick out. Um, but if you were to adjust for the different proportions of blood cell septides, what you would find is that most of these hits disappear. So, uh, in other words, these are what we would call false positives. Uh, and these false positives are being caused by a shift in the granulocyte to lymphocyte ratio. So, in the rheumatoid arthritis cases, you have more granulocytes, and therefore, because the methylation profile is different between granulocytes and lymphocytes, you pick out a lot of changes that are happening as a result of the disease. And the same is true for, for cancer. Okay? So this is what we call reverse causation. So, so the take-home message for this slide is that set up heterogeneity can inflate your statistics and lead to very high pulse, false positive rate. Now, it's important to understand, though, that set up heterogeneity can also have the opposite effect. And just to illustrate that, I'm going to show you some data from a, a study. This was a nested case control study within a randomized clinical trial that we published many years ago, where we did DNA methylation profiling in cervical smears. This was 152 liquid-based cytology samples. They were all of normal cytology, but half of these women developed an intraepithelial neoplasia three years later. Um, and so we were interested in trying to find differentially methylated sites between these two groups of normal samples. It turns out um, that if you, I mean, let me just show you, in fact, what, what, why cell type heterogeneity would be a problem here. Because if you, if you actually uh, do a PCA analysis, you would find that the top principal component accounts for 70% of the variation in the data. And if you have a way of estimating the fractions of immune cells, and I'll explain later how we do that, you can see that this top component is actually correlating with the fraction of immune cells. Okay? And in fact, no component correlates with this prospective cervical neoplasia status, which is what we actually wanted to predict. Okay? So this is actually general, uh, generally true, that whenever you, whenever you analyze epigenomic data within, let's say, uh, a cohort of, of normal samples, healthy, or relatively healthy individuals, or just at risk of, of disease, that most of the variation will be due to changes in cell type proportion. Therefore, this is something that you really need to adjust for, right? So in this particular case, if you now look for differentially methylated sites, it turns out that you don't get anything, you don't find anything. So the minimum false discovery rate is one. So the false discovery rate, in case you don't know about this, is related to the uh, positive predictive value. And this is a, this is a, a confidence measure uh, about tells you how confident you are of identifying a, a, a true positive, okay? So if you call something a positive, a CPG that is associated, that is actually a true positive, okay? So if you actually adjust for cell type heterogeneity, you can see how the 
minimum FDR rate now becomes less than 0 0.3, which means I've got 70% confidence of identifying some true associations. So it makes a dramatic difference. Okay? So in this particular case, it has the opposite effects. That it's actually deflating the statistics and causing a very high false negative rate. Okay, so you need to actually deal with this problem. Um, it is critically important, and I think it's one of the reasons why a lot of personalized medicine approaches are failing, because they're not taking into account this major confounder. Okay? So when we do set-up deconvolution, we need to effectively... We, there are sort of three aims. Uh, there's, one aim is to estimate cell type fractions in a given sample. This, of course, could have diagnostic or prognostic values. So, for instance, the amount of cytotoxic, cytotoxic T cells in your tumor environment could be prognostic. It is prognostic. Okay? Um, the second aim with cell type deconvolution would be to find differentially methylated cytosines, which are not driven by changes in cell type composition, okay? so that we can get rid of all these false positives that might occur due to these changes in cell type composition. And then a third task would be to identify the specific cell types that are driving the differential methylation. There are many different ways in which you can tackle the cell type uh, uh, heterogeneity problem, and I'm not going to go into all the different uh, paradigms that exist. I'm going to focus on, uh, on, on a set of tools which are known as reference-based. Uh, we provide guidelines, by the way, on which method to choose, which algorithm to choose, depending on your circumstances. Uh, I will not discuss that here. I'll leave you to, to read these papers in case you're interested. So what is the reference base? What are these reference-based methods? So I'm going to illustrate this in the context of an algorithm that we developed, which is called uh, hierarchical epitish. So this is epigenetic, stands for epigenetic dissection of sample heterogeneity. And the way it works is that if you have, say, a sample of interest, and you've got, let's say, for simplicity, you've got three main cell types here, you would build a reference, and I will show you an example of a reference on the next slide. So this is something that you would have, you would have generated, for instance, you would generate methylation profiles for purified cell types that are present in your tissue. And what you can then do using statistics is to infer these fractions. This tells you how much of the sample is epithelial cells, how much is total immune cell, uh, how many immune cells you've got, how many are fibroblasts. And then you can actually apply this in a recursive hierarchical way. So if you wanted to, to know how many B cells, CD4 T cells you have, you can reapply this again with a different reference, and you can end up getting a map, if you like, of all the, how, 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 how many cell types you have in each, in each uh, tissue, in each sample. So let me show you a reference. In fact, uh, this is a slide I showed you earlier. Um, so the way we would construct the reference is effectively by taking an average methylation over all the cells that are immune cells. So this, this data that was generated using fax sorting, by the way, uh, and these are uh, uh, cell lines from the ENCODE project. And so by, using, by finding CPGs that show these nice bimodal profiles and then taking the average, which I'm not showing here, but um, you can see that taking the average effectively is going to be the same thing almost as taking any one sample. Uh, uh, that you can build these uh, uh, reference matrices, okay? And so uh, you, can you can then construct this average and then use that to estimate these fractions. So does this work? And the answer is it works uh, remarkably well. So uh, this shows you the... Um, uh, we can validate this in many different ways. Uh, for instance, you can generate what we call in silico mixtures, where you mix... Uh, purified uh, profiles uh, together, independent profiles, by the way, of course, um, and you can see that you can get some very good correlations out. This is a validation in blood against uh, fax cell counts, uh, and so it works reasonably well. In fact, to the degree that maybe one could even say this is the gold standard, as fax counts are also subject to uh, error and are based on specific markers, which the assumption is that, that these would be homogeneous cell populations, and we know from single-cell studies now that they're not. So there's a lot of heterogeneity within even fax-sorted cell populations. Um, this is to show you how well this actually works, because this is a comparison in buckle swap saliva, cervix, two different cervix cohorts, that the fraction of immune cells that we estimate using these algorithms 
agrees remarkably well with the weights of the top principal components. So I mentioned earlier that most of the variation is actually driven by cell type heterogeneity. And one analysis is supervised, the other one is unsupervised. There's no reason why they should correlate so well. So effectively, this is telling us that using linear modeling will be a, a powerful way to adjust for it. Okay. And the other thing to note is that there's substantial variability. So some, for instance, some buckle swaps contain about 80% immune cells. Others are actually um, uh, mostly squamous epithelium. Uh, that's the other major component in buckle swaps. And, and this was not known. This, the, the, this was not known until very, fairly recently that there's such massive amount of variation. So um, if you want to derive biomarkers from these studies, you need to deal with this. So this allows us to rank the features. Um, um, sorry, this allows us to rank the tissues based on the degree of immune cell infiltration and also the variance. So if you rank them by mean, you can see here that saliva, well, if you're measuring, if you, if you collected saliva samples, most of it is actually leukocytes. Uh, cervix also has significant amount of uh, immune cell infiltration, but it's also the most variable of the tissues. Lung, for instance, about 40% of cells in lung tissue are immune cells, but you see that it's actually less variable between different individuals. This estimate of 40%, by the way, has been recently been confirmed using single cell analysis. Okay, so um, this is, this is, uh, th these are just immune cells, so you'll have, in lung you'll have other stromal contamination as well. Okay? So again, it's really important to be able to disentangle all, 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 all the different uh, components of a tissue. So then, um, I would also, uh, finally, I would like also like to uh, describe um, uh, 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 another challenge, which is how you identify the specific cell types that are driving differential methylation. So normally, when you look for uh, markers, uh, you derive these markers from these studies, you, you tend to just look you just you compare two phenotypes that say normal endometrial cancer, this is endometrial cancer, and you're trying to find uh, CPGs. This is one that maps to the HAN2 gene where you've got a very big difference in methylation. But what this does not tell you, if you just do the ordinary analysis, it doesn't tell you which of the cell types is changing. Maybe it's all of them. Maybe it's just a change in the epithelial compartment. Maybe it's a change in the immune cells. Um, so while we can... If we estimate the fractions of all the different cell types in the tissue, we can use that to identify changes that are happening independently of cell type composition. This on its own does not tell you which cell type is changing. Okay? And so what we have been working on is to develop a method to try that will tell us which particular cell type is changing. Right? So it could be that these two are not changing in cases of control, but this one is. And the concept actually is not that uh, uh, difficult to, to understand. So in, in effect, what we do is if we've got a data set, we, uh, so these are all the CPGs and you've got two phenotypes, we estimate the cell type fractions, as I've described before. And then what we effectively do is we try to find patterns in the data where you've got changes that look like this. So let's suppose that you have a CPG CPG1, which is hypermethylated, so it's, it's, it's got a higher methylation level in cases versus controls, but it's not changing in the other two cell types. Then what you would expect to see is that in those cases and controls where you have a lot of cell type 1, where cell type 1 is very abundant, that you would see a much bigger change in methylation, and conversely, in those samples where this cell type is not abundant, and because it's not changing in the other two cell types, you wouldn't actually uh, see, see much of a change. You wouldn't have the resolution. So this is sort of the concept, and you can translate that into statistics with something known as, something called as interaction terms, and you can actually then tell which cell type is changing. And so we have very recently been uh, validating this method, um, and it's actually quite important, for instance, in scenarios where you might have bidirectional changes. So, for instance, you could have a s situation where in a control sample, a given CPG site, so I'm, I'm displaying the CPGs now uh, as, 
as, as sort of, uh, uh, segments in this, in this pie chart. So you could have a site that acquires methylation in the case, but in an immune cell, this site could be, conceivably, could be methylated, right? Because there's a lot of differential methylation between cell types, but it could lose methylation. And so you would not be able to tell that it's differentially methylated between cases and controls. We would completely miss it uh, using standard methodology. But using our approach, using the cell DMC method, we can actually do much better. So this is, if you focus on these yellow box plots, you can see how this bidirectional two-cell type scenario, the sensitivity of a model which does not include interaction terms is very low. Right? You would not be able to detect these changes. But if you use interaction terms, you can improve the sensitivity quite dramatically. Uh, so it, it, it does make a big difference. So um, a very nice uh, uh, study where we, where we applied this to, to show that it works and that it can be uh, uh, used to, to uh, identify changes specifically happening in the squamous epithelial cells is a, is a study where uh, that we, uh, this was actually published already several years ago, where we performed Illumina methylation profiling in about 400 women. Uh, these were buckle swaps, uh, and the buckle swaps basically, as I've showed you earlier, about on average, about 50% of the cells are going to be leukocytes, and the other 50% is going to be squamous epithelium. There's a lot of variability, as I showed you, uh, between uh, individuals. Uh, we were particularly interested in this uh, to, 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 to see whether the changes in methylation that we see in buckle swaps, uh, what it would tell us uh, in relation to uh, potentially to uh, lung cancer. So we were particularly interested in finding changes that correlate with smoking, uh, which is, of course, a major risk factor for uh, lung cancers. So um, this is the sort of the finding using the cell DMC algorithm. And what I'm showing here on, in this plot here is the statistics of differential methylation in the immune cell compartment versus the epithelial compartment. And these red dots are CPGs. If you remember earlier, I said, I, I mentioned that there were about 62 CPGs that have been shown to be hypomethylated in the blood of smokers. Well, it turns out the algorithm predicts that these are hypomethylated in the immune cell compartment of the buckle swaps, which is actually uh, what, what, what makes sense. This makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it identifies changes also in the epithelial compartment. Um, and you can then start to try to validate these findings or try to see if they show more variability in the lung cancers from the, for instance, the cancer genome atlas, and you, show, you can find that they do show much, they show increases in variability in those tumor samples that are, uh, have a, more, a stronger epithelial component. And what is important is that these sites also undergo further changes in cancer compared to normal tissue. So in other words, these are, ch these are probably the changes that are more important from the perspective of cancer development, okay? Um, indeed, if you actually look at the enrichment, if you do biological enrichment analysis of these sites, you'll find that a lot of these map, again, to PRC2 targets. Uh, you also find that some of them, the ones that actually show hypermethylation, tend to be overexpressed in head and neck uh, uh, cancer, which, again, is a cancer that is, for which smoking is a, is a risk factor. Um, so um, it, it, it again highlights the fact that changes in methylation in response to risk factors do seem to happen specific regions in the genome. Let me return to this example of HAN2, which I mentioned earlier. This is a, a gene that is hypermethylated in endometrial cancer, and we wanted to know if the change is happening in all of the cell types that you find in, uh, in endometrial tissue or specific cell types. And the algorithm actually predicts that it's changing in all three cell types, both epith so epithelial, fibroblast, and immune cells. And this actually makes a lot of sense because um, it's a, this is a locus that is observed to change with age. So if you take blood, you find that this locus undergoes hypermethylation with age in blood. And in this particular comparison, you're actually comparing older individuals, cancers, to younger ones. So it would make sense that you actually see this, this hypermethylation. And the observed hypermethylation in fibroblasts is very significant. This was, uh, in fact, uh, we had previously also shown that in the fibroblasts of endometrial stroma, you get silencing of HAN2. Uh, 
And this silencing is related to, very surely related to this epigenetic uh, DNA methylation uh, uh, event. Uh, and in the context of a normal endometrium, uh, this silencing is uh, highly significant because the role of HAN2, in fact, it's, it's a target of progesterone receptor, which is the most important tumor suppressor pathway in this cancer. And so what actually happens if you get silencing in uh, endometrial cancer and also in hyperplasia, which is actually uh, a pre-cancer lesion, what this, uh, what this does is that these uh, fibroblasts, they... Uh, they will release uh, FGF factors so that you get, so HANTU normally suppresses the release of FGF factors. And so this paracrine signaling then leads to a sensitization. So these ep ep endometrial epithelial cells get sensitized to oncogenic estrogen. And so you've got a driving, you've got an increased mit uh, mitotic rate within the tissue. And this is what we think leads to the increased cancer risk. So, um, so it's a nice example the, uh, uh, of how uh, the epigenetic change at the particular local, uh, near the methylation change at the particular gene, which could be a tissue-wide phenomenon. So you see it in blood, you see it in the fibroblasts of endometrium and the epithelial cells of endometrium, but it's only in the context of the endometrial tissue where it, the, 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 effect, the functional effect could be really important because it's targeting the progesterone receptor pathway, which is, of course plays a key role in uh, endometrial cancer. Okay, so then the, the final uh, example of, uh, of, uh, that I would like to describe is one in, in, uh, in the context of uh, breast cancer. So this was a study where we were interested in trying to identify DNA methylation changes that you fought to. This is telling me I've got seven. Oh, this is the seven minutes. Five minutes, yeah. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, right. Uh, okay, so uh, we were interested in trying to find the methylation changes between the normal adjacent tissue of breast cancer patients uh, compared to women uh, that were healthy. So we had about 50 normals and 42 normal adjacent samples, and we wanted to find uh, differential methylated sites. Cut the long story short, you don't actually find any differentially methylated sites if you use standard uh, statistical methodology. Um, and of course, there could be a number of reasons for this. Maybe there are no changes really in the normal adjacent tissue, or it could be a confounding factor. And again, set heterogeneity is a candidate confounding factor here because it turns out that most of the variation that you see is really due to variations in the epithelial fat content of breast tissue. Um, and you can adjust for fat content, and you can see that you start to get more. You start to get a hint that there are some changes, but still, it's not very helpful. Um, and so, you need to use uh, a different approach. Uh, and uh, what we suggested at the time was that it would be probably too good to be true if you would be able to find really homogeneous changes such early on in cancer development. It's much more likely that the changes are going to be stochastic in the sense that maybe in some individuals, so, so, so these are uh, women that, that have breast cancer, some of them, the changes in methylation may happen at, at a particular site. In another CPG site, it might be another individual that shows a change. So, uh, that is exactly what you probably would expect, that very early on in cancer development you have a very stochastic pattern. But these outliers happen exclusively or mostly in those women that are at risk of uh, uh, developing cancer. And so we developed a method to actually identify these sites. Um, and the nice thing about the, the method, this method that we developed is that it, it allows you to, in effect, to uh, uh, get to, to, to avoid the, the, the problem of cell type heterogeneity. Um, if you actually think about it, uh, a site that shows a very stable methylation level across a lot of normal samples is very unlikely to be confounded by cell type heterogeneity because, as I've showed you, most of the variation is due to changes in cell type composition. So if you have a site that is so stably methylated, it means it's got the same methylation level in all of the cell types. And therefore, any change you see in the actual uh, normal adjacent tissue 
it's very likely to be a change that is happening in the epithelial compartment. The reason why we know that it's actually happening in the epithelial compartment is that you can then compare the breast cancer, so the matched breast cancers to the normal adjacent tissue, you can see that the methylation increases. So there's sort of an enrichment effect, suggesting that these events are being potentially selected for. And so you can, you can build uh, uh, models, risk prediction models, and in fact you can show that you can discriminate normal ADSM from normal tissue with very high degree of accuracy. Okay? And if you compare this, for instance, with copy number profiles, it turns out that you cannot do this with copy number profiles. So it's much harder to detect mutations in normal tissue, and somatic copy number changes uh, we did try, but we could not build a successful classifier. So, um, so I'll, I'll end there and uh, sort of take home messages that uh, uh, I've, I've, I've sort of listed them here. So the first one is that obviously cell type heterogeneity is a major source of confounding, reverse causation. It needs to be adjusted for. You can adjust for it using, uh, by measuring DNA methylation at the bulk tissue level, provided you've got an appropriate uh, DNA methylation reference matrix. This can be constructed. This reference matrix can be constructed using, for instance, uh, fact sorting. Although the future is, and I didn't mention this at all, the future will be, in fact, to use single-cell tissue-specific atlases, which are being generated at the RNA-seq level, and then perhaps to translate those to DNA methylation. So that's what we're currently doing. Uh, and this will open up the application to, you could be able to do the cell type deconvolution on literally any tissue type. Um, so, also to emphasize the fact that you can identify, we now have ways to say which cell types are changing, okay, um, just by measuring the bulk sample. Um, in terms of the biology, um, the, uh, what I've shown you is that DNA methylation changes that you measure normal tissue can discriminate tissue at risk, cancer risk from healthy normal tissue, in that it does seem that it has better discriminative power than somatic CNV mutation. So I'm not aware of any study in epithelial solid tissues where they've shown that mutational patterns can discriminate uh, the, sort of the normal adjacent tissue from the normal tissue. Um, we are a computational group, so we generate software uh, and the software is freely available. For those who don't do programming, we also have a web server. Uh, so, uh, and that's the end of my talk. And many thanks for your attention. I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew.